Art of Parlement from Tennis Magazine France. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I was wondering, how does it feel to be backed up by people like Rafa and Roger, and they were all your coach today, and uh, how do you manage to handle that? Yeah, it feels it feels great. Um, obviously, I was focused about the match and trying to uh, win it. And um, <clears throat> but it's uh, fun. You turn around, you have Rafa on one side and Roger on the other side trying to help you. So I didn't feel feel even though I lost the second set, I didn't feel like uh, I needed like an unbelievable amount of help. But they came with some good tips. I never played the deciding set in Labor Cup before. So uh, when it when we got to the deciding one, you know. They told me just you know stick to the right things, play one point by one point, and um, super tiebreak is only three points more than a normal tiebreak, but it seems much longer. So I think that was a good advice, and uh, yeah, feels a bit surreal to have them on on both sides. Chris Mayer's LabourCup.com. You are in great form at the moment, but in that second set, you were making errors that you just weren't making at the U.S. Open. Is that just because it? happens or was it a pressure of the occasion or was it something he was doing or what how dare you miss <laughs> <laughs> yeah no um i think some some weeks some places you feel the conditions a little better than others you feel a little bit more comfortable and uh, uh i've felt better than i've done so far on the court but uh in the really important moments i was able to win most of the points today but yeah that second set i played an awful game at 5-all, which was not good. They made two double faults and went too risky uh, with my second serve. And I couldn't sort of get a hold of Jack's game and especially his serve. And uh, yeah, I had a little bit of a chance at 4-3, I believe, in the second with Love 30. And then I did uh, maybe the only mistake, the forehand inside in, I remember. That was one that I should have made. But um, I mean, um, yeah, things go a little bit up and down. We are we are humans as well, so we don't make every shot when it really matters. But uh, if I make 80 or 90 percent of the right uh, choices or the right shots at the right time, I will be happy. But you have to also accept that sometimes uh, not everything can go your way. Hi, Marianne Beavis, the Sport Review. Um, Rafa has talked about the sort of nerves associated with having to play with Roger tonight mm -hmm. and try and get the win. I guess there's a f some of that feeling through the whole of the European team that you want it to end up being a win, almost to celebrate his last event. It, 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 is that how it feels? For sure. I mean, uh, when when the news came that it was just going to be his uh, last tournament or last event for Roger, I immediately thought, you know, of course, how sad it was, but also that I'm going to give it all to try to help him in a way and help the team to for him to finish with a win and uh, it's a special event and uh, Europe we are up 4-0 when it comes to head to head so we want to win and make it five in a row but it's tough team world have a good team but uh, yeah it's it's a little bit extra special and uh, I remember <coughs> after I won opening game I went to take some drink and I was uncertain to who should I look at at the bench because like should I look at Roger or Rafa, Andy or Novak, like who of the big ones should I look at and sort of get like confirmation like okay let's go. So it's tough to, to be, it was a little bit tough and nerve wracking to be out there but uh, I think we all gonna give, give it all for the team but also extra special for Roger and we all want him to finish his, his career in the best possible, possible way with a win. Uh, Kasper, hi, it's uh, Simon Cambers, ESPN.com. How, how much can you learn from uh, the likes of Roger, Rafa, Novak, Andy on a week like this when you get to see them up close? And have you dropped in the fact that you're the highest ranked player here? <laughs> <laughs> I have not told them, but uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, they are obviously older than myself and uh, they're at the point of their career where, you know, the end is closer to what to the beginning uh, than, than the beginning. So it's inevitable that they will have to all retire at some point. But um, yeah, it's it's impressive to see Novak, Rafa, and Andy, of course also Roger. But uh, now that he's retiring, I can you know say more about the other three that they are still hungry and they have won everything there is to win, but they still want to go for more and. Uh, 
yeah, every practice is still important for them. They don't take anything for granted, and um, it's um, it's impressive to see. Like I said, because um, because they have experienced it all, they have won it all, and everything there is to win. But they're still hungry for more. So that's something I will try to think about if I'm in when I'm getting older, and uh, if I'm getting you know more and more tired towards the end of my career. I will think you know <laughs> Roger played until he was 41 and then enjoyed and. Rod, uh, Rafa, Novak, and they all were winning slams at 36, 37, so it shows just how uh, incredible they are. Hi, Casper. Um, Stephen Higgins from RT Radio in Ireland. Uh, I remember writing about you in 2018 when Norway played Ireland and you won three points mm -hmm. and you were ranked in the 200s. Mm -hmm. Could you have imagined then that you would mm -hmm. get into the top 50, let alone be number two in the world? <laughs> no, uh, I, I don't think I... Uh, expected it or at least not uh, only four years later um, I remember when I started like uh, middle school or what you call it when not between elementary and high school we have three years in Norway and I went to this athletic school and we first week was a task to present something about yourself and your goals for your career and I said I, I wrote down a goal that what I felt was reasonable was to be top 50 by 2025, so um, it's uh, been going much faster and I've uh, experienced and did much better than I I thought was reasonable to think, but uh, I, I'm ta I take it. I mean, at the same time, you see players like Sasha, Daniel and Stefanos who were better before me showing it was possible, so I thought, you know, I also want to join that group and be competitive with them and uh, show that uh, it's possible to do well, and now we have the number one who is only 19. So it shows that you can you can break through younger than maybe you think sometimes yourself. But uh, yeah, if you had given me the contract to be number two and uh, play Labor Cup with this team and two finals of Grand Slam this year back in 2018, I would sign it for sure. Casper, mm -hmm. back at the Craig Gabriel from mm -hmm. Labour Cup Radio. Um, I think you touched on court about the locker room aspects and apparently Andy Murray has said that Roger is the noisiest <laughs> of all in the locker room. What are your secrets in the locker room as far as the messiest player or the most annoying player or frustrating or whatever? Ah, good one. Um, but uh, yeah, it's true that Roger is the... Uh, the, the loudest and the funniest of all. He all sort of has, you know, all these nicknames on all the players. Um, calls Bjorn the king, which I think is very, he deserves. Uh, so every time he sees Bjorn, he calls him the king in Swedish because he's Swed Swedish. So that's always fun to hear. And uh, he has many jokes, but I don't know. Uh, Rafa is pretty messy, honestly. So shoes and clothes are hanging everywhere. But uh, on court, he's not messy, so he he saves all the energy for the court, I guess. But uh, honestly, he's a bit messy with his shoes, particularly. <laughs> Hi, Casper. Howard Fendrich with the Associated Press. I mean, first, I'd like to ask to, if you'd tell us a few more nicknames. <laughs> Well, I, I don't remember them all, but uh, every morning, like when we see each other, Roger is very excited to see all the players. Uh, he talks a little bit Swedish with me as well, because he had a lot of Swedish coaches, so he knows some words and some sentences, and I was impressed on how much he knows. So uh, I don't think he has a nickname for me, but, um, you know, Bjorn is, is the king, and Rafa is Rafa, obviously, and uh, yeah, he just likes to joke around, and. Uh, and it's fun. Um, he always brings a good energy, a good vibe, and it's been very fun to get to know him a little better and uh, see what type of person he's on off the, off the court because it's not easy for, you know, it's not easy as a young player to, to be too much around these big four legends, and especially in the last years. They have been a little bit on and off the tour, so uh, it's fun for me to get to know him a little bit better. And <clears throat> what I actually wanted to ask before was, uh, you were talking about sort of some of the things you've observed or maybe learned being around mm -hmm. some of these greats of the game. Uh, wondering if you could discuss how you think what Federer, Djokovic, and Nadal have done with their success in Grand Slam tournaments, how maybe that's changed the paradigm or the way people see 
Grand Slam success. You know, nobody had won more than 12 till Sampras got to 14, and now mm -hmm. 20 years later, three guys destroyed that number. Mm -hmm. how, how does that change, do you think, the way maybe players, fans, see those tournaments and those numbers? Yeah, it is, uh, it's, it's um, yeah, they brought it to a whole different level and show that uh, anything is possible and uh, you could, you know, just imagine or think if one of the three was not there, how many of the two other ones would have, they would probably be close to 30 um, because it's those three have, who have dominated the most. They have, what is it, 63 slams among them and Andy has three and then Bjorn has 11, is it? So it's like, yeah, 77 Grand Slams in the locker room. So it's uh, pretty crazy when you think about it. And uh, yeah, they have just taken, I think they have taken tennis to a whole different level and they've been able to keep it for 17, 18 or yeah, almost 20 years, which has been incredible. And uh, it has given young players like myself and the other younger generation inspiration to see how well it's possible to play. And um, the record is currently at 22, which is uh, when Sampras set it for 14. Some, you know, people probably thought, you know, it's not going to be broken in a good time. And then these guys come and they break it, uh, three, all three of them. So let's see if uh, how long it stands. But you will have, you will need maybe only one or two guys who will dominate like crazy than uh, than uh, for many years to beat it. And yeah, it's just uh, incredible to think that three players have over 60 slams together. So I don't think that record will be broken uh, ever but uh, yeah let's see um, let's see in the future anything can happen of course but it's it's an incredible record okay um, hi Casper it's uh, Paul Myers from Radio France International it's coming up for retirement um, what do you think he should do should he be at tournaments and or just fade into the background for Roger what would you like him to do would you like him to still be a visible presence? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, he's, he loves tennis. He talks about tennis a lot and uh, remembers a lot of matches he played uh, and all the stories. So obviously that's what drives him and has drives you know all players. But um, I hope he is involved somehow. Uh, I think uh, it's only suiting if many you know stadiums or events or whatever. Uh, gets named after him and I think those three big three will have many things in tennis named after them in the future so uh, and win a lot of awards and prizes so I hope he will be around and come to some tournaments obviously he has a family he has four kids and everything that he needs to take care of first but I'm sure he will miss it a little bit and come to uh, tournaments once in a while he's involved with labor cup so he will always sh it's a good chance he will show up here but uh, and I guess Basel is where he grew up. He's been, hopefully he can be around in that tournament. But I don't know, I mean, that's up to him to decide. But I think all players will miss him. Uh, we have missed him for some years already when he's not on tour. And it's just a great vibe when he's back and he brings a lot of joy, energy, and uh, yeah, inspiration around him. I have a quick question for Thomas. Thomas, what, um, I was wondering what it's like for you spending time with Bjorn this week because I imagine he'd be such a superstar in, in Sweden and around the world. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great honor for me to, to be here around and, and help Bjorn. He was my big idol when I grew up and the reason why I started to play tennis. Uh, and uh, yeah, being a young boy in Sweden, uh, a whole generation looked up to Bjorn, so it's, it's, it's obviously very special. Is he as cool as he looks? He's cooler. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Even cooler. Even cooler. Yeah. He's the king. When you get named the king by Roger, you will do something right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.